One day, about 10 years ago, I got a call from Felix Yarbrough. He said, I have something I want to send you. There's somebody you need to know about, he said, and I think you need to tell her story here at the church. The people at IPC need to know about this woman. And a few days later, I received in the mail a big manila envelope that was full of newspaper clippings and photos and information about a woman named Oleona May Jones, who was born in 1881 and was superintendent, manager, what was sometimes called camp mother, at the Children's Fresh Air Farm from 1928 to 1945. The envelope also had copies of the pages of a small book called Living Epistles. The book was written by Miss Jones, published in 1949. It was a collection of 10 true stories about some of the people whose lives had touched hers during her long career as a teacher and social worker. In the introduction to that book, she wrote, I am sure I was born a social worker, for when Santa brought me my first doll, that doll soon became not a toy to be admired, but a poor, sick child to be loved, clothed, hospitalized. It was always in trouble. Her family lived in Norfolk, Virginia, and unlike many women in the late 1800s, she received a college education. She graduated from Lewisburg College for Women in Lewisburg, North Carolina. She returned to her alma mater to teach expression. Now students major in communications, but back then young ladies learned expression. But she eventually left that teaching position in order to go to New York City to pursue graduate studies in social work. She eventually became the welfare supervisor at a mill town. She worked at the Birmingham YWCA for six years. She worked at YWCAs in Baltimore, Maryland and Lexington, Kentucky, learning, as she would later write, every angle of social work. In one of her epistles, she wrote, a social worker is so much in the habit of trying to help people, she often appears officious, assumes a bit more authority than is hers to claim. Riding in a county bus one day, I heard an elderly man say to the driver, let me off at Spring Lane, this side of Hueytown. I looked over at the old man and I saw that he had two pairs of crutches with him. Immediately, my social worker brain set to work to evolve a plan for the easiest way to help him manipulate two pairs of crutches. When the bus stopped at Spring Lane, I was ready. Stepping forward, I said, here, let me assist you. I'll hold one pair of crutches and you use the other to get off the bus. Suppose you try going down the steps backwards. That might be best. The man looked at me, bewildered but meekly handed over one pair of crutches and backed down the steps with the other. When he reached the sidewalk and I handed him the other pair of crutches, he said, thank you kindly, lady. I went to a yard sale and bought these crutches. I figured somebody in my family would break a leg sooner or later and they'd come in handy. And with his two pairs of crutches thrown over his shoulder, he walked off whistling. I slunk down in my seat on the bus like a punctured tire, and when I reached my destination, the bus driver was still laughing at me. Need any help getting down those steps, lady? All I could say was, well, I don't need any crutches. In another epistle, she wrote, perhaps the richest years of my life were spent in the employ of the Independent Presbyterian Church of Birmingham, Alabama as manager of the Children's Fresh Air Farm on Shades Mountain. During those 17 years, some 4,000 little ones were our precious guests. What a golden privilege it was. What a challenge to always try to do one's best, for no one can live with children and fail to catch their loyalty, their purity, their faith, their love, their forgiveness, their funny, unaffected, 
appealing naturalness. Happy is anyone who can answer half their questions in a satisfactory manner. Questions like, when does a lady end and an old maid begin? Or, where do stars come from? Did the moon lay them? Does God know how hot it is down here? If he does, why don't he do something about it? I tell you, I'm about to catch fire. Why don't God make long tails on the frogs so we can catch them easier? When will this pression stop pressing so we can have some shoes and clothes? When one child asked me, why don't you ask God to make you little or use too fat? I answered, because I'm busy asking God to make you fatter, you're too thin. Then with a sigh, the child said, as I got to stay here till I gets as fat as you? There were unanswerable questions to field as well. Questions like, what made my daddy go off and leave us and live with them other folks? Don't he love us no more? We love him. What becomes of little girls when their mama goes away and don't come back? Do you know how I can find my mama? I asked God to find her every night. He hadn't found her yet. And so it goes, she wrote, until with tears in your heart you say, whose turn is it to choose our story tonight? And then there's a happy story and hugs all around as each child is tucked in and sleep comes with its balm of soothing and forgiveness. And there were stories every night, at bedtime, and in the afternoons as well. In fact, Felix Yarborough's first description of her to me was, she was a master storyteller. And pictures in her books and photos in articles in the Birmingham Age Herald newspaper usually so show her with children gathered around her listening as she told a story. Once, describing her charm and ability as a speaker, IPC's own Dr. Henry Edmonds said, every time Miss Jones makes a talk of any kind, she rings the bell. But she wasn't just words and stories. She also put her faith and her love for people, especially children, into action. Remember, she was superintendent of the Children's Fresh Air Farm from 1928 to 1945, years of tremendous social upheaval. The long, dark years of the Depression, four years of World War II. And during her tenure, in addition to running the Fresh Air Farm in the summer, she began a new program called the Opportunity Farm. It was hosted at the Fresh Air Farm location, but it operated during the winter, making a home for teenage boys who had been identified by the County Children's Aid Department. Those boys went to public school, but they also did odd jobs around the Bluff Park neighborhood. They worked at the farm, and they earned regular wages. Miss Jones realized that some of those 15 and 16-year-old boys had never in their lives had 50 cents of their own to spend. And so she would organize expeditions into town to teach them how to shop. Most of them had never been to town before. And one of the challenges that she faced was helping those boys overcome their fear of elevators. Newspaper columnist Dolly Dalrymple writing an article about the fresh air farm for the Birmingham Age Herald, said, Out at the farm, children found a lady who could take care of them whether they were sick or well, who had more nice ways of helping them have a pleasant time than any lady in their experience. Miss Jones tells them wonderful stories after they've gone for a hike and wound up on Sunset Hill to watch the red sun go down. She's the one who directs the stunts around the campfire, and she tells them about the trees and plants and creatures in the woods. It's Miss Jones who knows how to bandage a stubbed toe or get a pesky cinder out of an eye. And if you don't like to drink milk, she knows how to make you like it. There are also things she does for the children that they don't even know about. 
like the little girl whose flowers positively refused to grow in her flower bed at the farm and who cried bitterly one night while she said her prayers because her garden wouldn't do like everyone else's. That child will never forget her astonishment when she went out the next morning and found a bright red dahlia growing in the very spot where only poor dead leaves had been the day before. That little girl never saw the kind soul who looked suspiciously like Miss Jones, who had transplanted that dahlia. But perhaps there are some things it's just as well not to know. By the way, Miss Jones wrote about that same incident in one of her epistles, but she described the good elf who had transplanted that flower simply as a staff member. She didn't take credit for it herself. Her kind heart and generous spirit did not just suddenly appear when she arrived at the Fresh Air Farm in 1928 at the age of 47. It had been part of her makeup since she was playing social worker to her childhood dolls. And it was demonstrated in the incident she describes in her 10th epistle, the final story in her collection, and the one I want to share with you this morning. This particular incident happened when Miss Jones was in her 20s, in the early part of the 1900s, over a hundred years ago, a time that seemed so different from our hurried, digitized, cynical world. And in fact, when you hear this story, you would be forgiven for thinking it was all made up. Modern listener that you are, you could be excused for thinking, oh, come on, that's not true. Could there ever really have been people that kind, that generous? Could something that good really have happened? Are you sure this isn't just some cheesy Hallmark Christmas special or some sentimental O. Henry story? No, it's not. It really happened. There really were people this kind, this generous, and one of them was named Oleona May Jones. I want to read her story to you rather than tell it from memory because Miss Jones wrote the story in the first person, and I want to read it to you just that way so that you hear her voice telling about something that really happened to her. Now remember, this story takes place in the early 1900s, a time when there were still telegrams and pay phones and horse-drawn sleighs with bells, a time when it was okay for children to play with scissors and pocket knives. This story seemed to me to be an especially appropriate one to tell this year for two reasons. First, I wanted to tell it in honor and memory of Felix Yarbrough, who was always on the lookout for a good story, especially one that might inspire others. And secondly, I wanted to tell it this year because, well, because we find ourselves this year having an odd, dislocated kind of Christmas, one that is not turning out the way we expected it to, not turning out maybe the way we planned it a year ago or even a few months ago. It's a Christmas where some people are feeling alone, disappointed, sad, maybe even resentful about so much that's been lost this year, wondering, Where's the Christmas in that? Where's the comfort and joy and peace and goodwill in that? Well, this is a story about another odd, dislocated kind of Christmas, a Christmas that did not turn out at all the way it was planned, one where there were people who felt alone and disappointed, sad, and a little lost. And it's a story that shows how those people found Christmas, found comfort and joy and peace and goodwill, not in spite of that, but because of that. 
from Oleona May Jones, her 10th epistle, a story she called An American Christmas Carol. Some years ago, when I was studying at a New York school, a letter came from my sister in Virginia reminding me that this was the Christmas when our family was having its regular reunion, and since Christmas came on a Sunday that year, she hoped all of us could be there for the weekend. Oh, what a thrill that reminder gave me. And from that moment on, I was never entirely forgetful of the happiness ahead. Even while studying, it was always there in the back of my mind. And oh, the plans, letters back and forth, telegrams, gifts to buy and wrap, and always time out of every hour just to dream and rejoice, thinking about that happy gathering. I tacked a small calendar to my bedpost, and every night I would mark off another day and count the number of days, even the number of hours that I had to live through until it was time to leave for Norfolk. The day finally dawned. The plan was this. I would travel on Saturday, Christmas Eve, take the noon train from New York to Baltimore, and from there take the night boat to Norfolk. I'd arrive early Christmas morning, spend all of Christmas Day with my family, and return to New York on the night boat Sunday night, reporting for class early Monday morning. The visit would be brief, but wonderful. The train pulled out of New York on time Saturday morning, packed to capacity with happy passengers going home for Christmas. But the greater the number of travelers, the longer the train stood still at every station, while the hour for the departure of my boat got closer and closer. When we finally arrived in Baltimore, there were just 20 minutes to cross the city to get from the train station to the boat. Christmas traffic was jammed on every street, and we crept along until finally, when the taxi stopped at the wharf, I could see curls of smoke puffing away from the old boat miles down the bay. I leaped frantically from the taxi, halfway thinking I might start running across the water. I had to be on that boat. But, of course, I had missed it. Bewildered and sick with disappointment, I went to a hotel, hoping that once I was out of the throngs of people and the noise and confusion, I could plan my way out. It was my first night in a hotel alone in a strange city, but I was tired beyond expression, and whether I wanted to or not, as soon as my head touched the pillow, I was asleep. The next morning, I opened my eyes and lay still, listening to the sounds of early Christmas morning, the jingle of sleigh bells, the tooting of horns, firecrackers, pop guns, the hurrying of many feet on the street below my window. So many people, and here I was, alone, away from my family, in a strange city, a long day ahead, and what to do with it. Stay here in the hotel and feel sorry for myself, I thought. No, surely there must be some child who dreams of a Santa who will not come unless I go find him. Almost immediately, I was up and dressed, breakfast eaten, and at the hotel desk asking the clerk, would you please give me the name and address of the largest hospital in the city, one that has a charity ward for children? And then, as rapidly as transit was possible, I stood in front of the superintendent of that hospital saying, do you have any child here who will not receive a gift today? She thought for a moment. Well, of course, she said, every child will have a bag of fruit, and most of them will have gifts from their homes. But yes, there is one little fellow here, a newsboy who was hurt in a car accident some months ago. He says he has no relatives, that he was living with an aunt who did not want him. We've advertised for any family that might claim him, but we've had no replies. 
He's ready to leave the hospital, and we're making plans to turn him over to the state for adoption. As far as I know, he will have no gifts. May I play Santa to him? I asked. Of course, she said. I'll take you up and let you meet him. He's an adorable fellow, quite a favorite with the nurses. We will really feel bereft when we finally have to give him up. We hurried down a long corridor and into a ward with many little beds, and from the covers on each bed peeped a pale little face with eager, expectant eyes. The superintendent steered me to a bed in the far corner of the room and said, Jamie, here's someone to see you. To see me? You don't know me, do you? No, I said, I've come to get acquainted with you. What's your name? What made you come see me? Well, I'll tell you, I said. I was on my way home to Virginia to see my family, and I missed my boat. I didn't want to go back to New York just yet, and so I decided to find someone to play with me today. Gosh, the child said, I'm glad you picked me. What you want to play? Let's play circus, I said. You know how to play circus? Oh, yes, I know how to play circus, but we'll have to play a quiet sort of circus. We can't make too much noise here. Can the other children play too? I asked. He agreed. And very soon we had collected scissors and wrapping paper and were busy cutting out a big tent and all sorts of paper animals when the doors of the ward were thrown open and the nurses and doctors entered to make their rounds. Our grand circus parade had to come to a halt. As I stood up to go, I said, Jamie, do you know what today is? Sure, I said, it's Christmas, but there ain't gonna be one here, is there? Certainly, I said, there's always a Christmas everywhere. You believe that bunk about Santa Claus? Yes, I do, I said, but it isn't bunk. Well, Santa Claus is just your mother and dad, ain't he? No, not necessarily, I said. I think Santa, well, I think Santa is a sort of spirit that wants to make someone happy by giving them something. Sometimes that spirit is in your mother or father, or it might be in the heart of a friend. Well, I want to be that friend for you this Christmas, and so shut your eyes and think real hard and tell me two things you would most like to have. I don't have to shut my eyes to tell you that, nor think hard, neither. I know exactly what I want. I want a mother and a pocket knife. Perhaps Jamie saw the concern on my face, for he came back with, That's got you stumped, hadn't it? No, I said, I've known Santa to do big things in my day. I'm going now and see what I can find. You let the nurse get you all taken care of, and I'll be back soon. A tragic expression came over his face. He clutched at my hand and said, No, no, sit down, don't go, please don't go. I'd rather have you stay here with me than go find Santa, because if you go, I'll never see you again. That's the way everyone does me. They come, and we get acquainted and have a good time, and then they leave, and they promise to come back, but they never do. Nobody that's ever promised that has ever come back, and that's the way you'll do me, too. Oh, no, Jamie, I said, I'll really come back whether I find Santa or not. Cross your heart, you will? Yes, cross my heart. Make a cross and spit in it? Yes, make a cross and spit in it. Raise your right hand? Yes, Jamie, yes, I'm really coming back. I was hurrying out of the hospital, about to hail a bus, when I remembered. This is Christmas Day. And it's Sunday. Every store is closed. Buses and cars sped past. Crowds hurried along. Men and boys walked past me. Just think, I thought to myself, there is a pocket knife in every one of those pockets, and I can't get one when I want one more than I want anything in all the world. It was snowing and a mean wind had sprung up, and so I went back inside to the warmth of the hospital lobby. I sat down to work my way out of this predicament, and the only thing I knew to do at that moment 
was pray. Dear God, I whispered, you have never failed me, and I know you want this boy to be happy too, so please guide me so that I will know what to do right now. I sat a moment in the silence, and then the idea came to me. I walked over to the information desk and asked who owned the largest hardware store in the city. Then, with my heart all aflutter, I stepped into the telephone booth, dropped in a coin, and dialed the number that I found in the telephone directory. A man answered. Hello, I said. Is this Mr. Cruz? No, this is the butler. We never disturb Mr. Cruz on Sunday. What is the nature of your business? I'm sorry, I said. I cannot tell you. I must speak directly to Mr. Cruz. After a moment, the same voice came back. Mr. Cruz will see you in his office at 9 o'clock tomorrow morning. No, I said, I will be in New York tomorrow morning, and it is very important that I talk to him now. Dead silence, then a stern, deep voice. This is James Cruz. Mr. Cruz, I said, I am so sorry to intrude this way, but there is a little boy in the general hospital who craves a pocket knife for Christmas, and every place where I might get one is closed today. Could you let someone meet me at your store and sell me a knife? That's a very strange request. Yes, I know it is, but the boy has no family, and he wants it so much, and this is Christmas Day, and he is such a precious boy. I'll pick you up at the west entrance to the hospital in 20 minutes. In 20 minutes, I was standing at the west entrance of the hospital when a limousine rolled up to the curb silver mountings, coat of arms, a chauffeur in uniform. I felt like such an intruder, so unnatural and stiff as I was tucked behind a fur robe in the back seat. But there was too much at stake, no turning back now. Mr. Cruz was seated back there too, and after we introduced ourselves, he sat there, silently staring straight ahead. As we drove along the quiet streets, I tried to tell him about Jamie and why such a favor was being asked, but he gave no response. When we stopped in front of the store, Mr. Cruz gave a whispered order to the chauffeur who drove away as we entered the store. We stepped into an elevator, Mr. Cruz pushed a button, and when the elevator door opened, I found that we had landed in a fairyland of toys. As I was selecting the pocket knife, Mr. Cruz was gathering up other things that he knew a boy would like. A ball, a top, a monkey climbing a string, marbles, everything to delight a boy's heart. My own heart was very nearly jumping right out of my body, but that emotion was nothing compared to what I felt when we arrived back at the car and I found it was packed with bags of nuts, candy canes, popcorn, balloons, fruit, enough for every child in that children's ward at the hospital to have something. When we got near the hospital, I said, Mr. Cruz, you have been so wonderful already, but might I ask you to do one more thing? Let me run ahead and tell Jamie that I found Santa and then you and the chauffeur follow with the gifts. It took some persuading, but finally he agreed. I ran upstairs, three steps at a time, ran down the hall and threw open the door of the ward to announce the good news. Jamie was sitting up in bed watching the door, and when he saw me, he began clapping his hands and screaming out, you did come back, you did come back, did you find Santa? Oh, yes, I said, and what a Santa. Just then, Mr. Cruz and the chauffeur entered, and coming over to where Jamie was, they dropped all their packages on his bed. They were about to turn away when Jamie came to from his bewilderment, jumped up, pulled Mr. Cruz down to him, and hugged him and kissed him all over his face, saying, You are a real-life Santa, ain't you? 
here's my pocket knife, and bully, ain't it a peach? All the other children in the ward looked on in excitement, and I ran from bed to bed to assure them that Santa had brought something for each of them, too. And when I turned back to Jamie, I saw that Mr. Cruz and the chauffeur had gone. I ran down the corridor and caught them just as they were walking into the elevator. Oh, Mr. Cruz, I said to the back of his overcoat, you mustn't go until I try to thank you. He turned, and I saw the deepest emotion I'd ever seen in a man's face. I took his hands and held them while he sobbed out his story, the tears running down his cheeks. You do not need to thank me, Miss Jones, he said. It is I who must thank you. A year ago, my wife and I lost our only child, a boy about Jamie's age, and we just have not been able to accept it. Two weeks ago, my wife and I agreed that we would not observe Christmas at home this year. No gifts, no decorations, no cards, nothing. But this little boy today has done something to me. I'm going to go home and bring my wife back here, and I'm sure we can take Jamie home with us for the holidays. Oh, I said, that's perfect, for then he will get both things he wished for, a pocket knife and a mother too. Jamie never left the home of Mr. and Mrs. Cruz. After a year, he was legally adopted he was educated at Princeton University, and for a graduation gift, he was given a leisurely trip around the world with the privilege of taking a friend with him. I was that fortunate friend. That was years ago. Mr. Cruz has died, leaving Jamie in charge of his business. Jamie has married and has his own home and children now. And every Christmas, he gathers together in his home 40 or 50 homeless boys, and he gives his entire day to them. They each get a complete outfit, clothing, shoes. There's a tree with gifts, a delicious Christmas dinner. And then each boy is permitted to select his own recreation for the afternoon, a ball game, a movie, a ride, whatever appeals. And thus, Jamie continues to pass on to a great group of children each year the joys that were his when he was a stranger and they took him in. An American Christmas Carol by Oleona May Jones. Merry Christmas. <laughs>